Hey everyone and welcome to the Alpha 8 podcast. I'm your host Herman Bieneck and the co-founder of Alpha 8. We will discuss everything from emergency response initiatives to the intense battle against wildlife crimes. We will even get you into the thrilling chases of hunting down poachers with guns and so much more. So join me in these conversations where every story highlights the sheer determination and bravery of those making a real difference. Those people on the ground. When lives are on the line, every second counts and every action matters. So grab a seat, get comfy and become a part of our mission. Welcome back to the Alpha Aid podcast. I'm so excited. We're going to sit down with Herman and Bernd Krishman. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. He's like close enough. <laughs> From Alpha Aid. And it's so nice to sit down and kind of, we really wanted to pull back the curtain and meet the people behind the mission. So Bernd, if you could jump in the time machine and tell us how you got started, what your background is, all the good juicy details. I got started in, in help with um, through my mother, who is a nurse or was a nurse in her days here in Namibia. And she trained first aiders um, in various categories. And as a kid, I obviously had to get involved and also slap a couple of um, clusters on people, band-aids and so forth. Yeah, Through meeting Herman, um, obviously getting deeper into this, um, starting Alpha 8, and yeah, just giving back. That's, that's the one side. Then the other side is the environmental side. I grew up in Africa, in Namibia, and um, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy wildlife. And I became a wildlife cameraman. And so I spend a lot of time outside, out in the bush uh, with animals and get to see amazing things. And um, yeah, I really enjoy that, really like that. And unfortunately, also saw more and more of the nasty things that are going on out there. And that's what we then incorporated into Alpha 8 as well. We're often shown a picture of what things look like in places that we have not ventured to. Um, so being from Namibia and growing up there and seeing, I'm sure you've seen so many things changing. What I guess, can you paint us a picture of what it looks like there, where you are and kind of what you've experienced in regards to like the tourism? And we talk a lot about anti-poaching rings and animal activism. Like, what does that look like for somebody who has never been to the country? Or, you know, some people may have not even been aware of where it is in the world. Namibia is in southwestern Africa. Um, it was called Southwest Africa before independence. Um, we are nestled between um, Angola to the north, Botswana to the east, um, the Atlantic Ocean to the west, and South Africa to the south. So yeah, right at the bottom end of Africa. Uh, where I live is I live right in the at the coast, um, right next to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, we might be able to hear the waves outside. Um, and this is desert country. So uh, we have dunes. I've got uh, dunes about five minutes drive away from my house. Got um, beautiful big dune landscape. Um, and then we go through a normal classic uh, desert scape into a dry savanna, which is most of the rest of the country is like a dry savanna environment. So beautiful out of Africa, um, beautiful acacia trees, lots of animals. So that's, that's Namibia in a nutshell. Tourism is a very big factor and very big industry in Namibia. The numbers have just been released that this is, I think we just had the biggest um, visitor numbers or the highest visitor numbers ever in Namibia, which is quite amazing for, you know, for the short after the big lockdowns that we had recently. There was something I vaguely remember. And... Um, so yeah, so tourism is a good thing, or is a is a big big industry in this country. Um, through that, we have a lot of um, nature reserves and environmental reserves, which are either government. Um, I think close to twenty percent or twenty five percent of the. I'm I'm talking under correction here. 
of the Namibian uh, surface are national parks. Um, like, for example, the whole coastal area from our southern border to the northern border along the coast um, is, is in a national park of sorts. Um, then we've got a couple of bigger um, parks, like, for example, the Etosha National Park, which is about the size of Switzerland, the country of Switzerland. Well, to the US, yes, that is not very big, but to most other countries around, that is fairly, fairly large. And our, uh, most of our tourists are from, from Europe. Um, Europe and Asia, and also a growing number of, of Americans coming to Namibia. The nice thing is because of these, these tourist numbers and, and this importance that nature parks or environmental parks, even private parks, are, are very big. And private enterprises, private farmers that um, dedicate their land to environmental and, and animal um, survival and um, yeah, protection. I'm curious if you and Herman can kind of remember back any stories like conservation stories or, you know, being out in the wild stories of when you guys are together in Namibia. Yeah, we have um, had a few interesting trips through Namibia um, on various occasions. Um, uh, yeah, one thing came to mind, which we had on a recent trip, is uh, we had electric bikes, which we tested for an anti-poaching um, uh, um, unit. Um, yeah, they're, they're quite nice, we thought, and very fast and not that noisy. And we um, almost got chased down by a herd of oryx who decided they need to run next to us and they have to cross the road and not move away from us, but cross the road and almost took one of us out. It was you, actually. Yes, yeah, so they wanted to take you out. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was one of us, yes. <laughs> yeah, they, um, I had a very close encounter with a fairly large oryx bull on an electric bicycle. I remember that part as well, and um, it was the first time in my life that I'm in the middle of a herd of oryx, and those those animals are huge, and uh, we did about, what, 35, 40 miles an hour, and they were faster than us, and it was, I want to say, what, burned 150 pe uh, pieces, right? Oh, oh, animals. Least, yeah. It was, was a lot, and... Um, I felt like I was in the first Jurassic Park movie, to be honest. For people who don't know what oryx are, could you, are they likened to like, are they like gazelles? Um, it is an antelope. Oh, antelope, antelope. Um, so it's about the size of a, of, of a large horse, more or less. And then it's got um, amazing, just very long straight horns, which um, both male and female have. That probably and, uh, double as skewers. <laughs> uh, yeah, they they are known to take each other on in fights and and inflict serious injuries on each other. And also, a lot of predators are very wary of of the oryx because of those skewers. <laughs> I had to do a quick Google search because I'm like, I know he's saying oryx, but what is that? <laughs> <laughs> um. um we are coming out with a uh, with a Alpha Eight Safari Speak uh, series on YouTube, uh, where we all introduce all the animals there are down there. Everybody who doesn't know what an oryx is, please go on our channel, and uh, sooner or later you will see that one episode about the oryx, without our weird encounter here. Yeah, but but at least in various different languages. Exactly. That's so great because I feel like we don't get exposed to a lot of animals, you know, especially, you know, different continent, different climates, different environments. Um, I'm curious, do each of you have a, like your favorite African animal? Yeah. One, just to, to point out one favorite, I don't know, there, there are various um, nice animals. The, the oryx is a beautiful animal and it's quite, it looks abundantly. Um, the kudu, which is another antelope, um, has um, corkscrew horns that twist um, like big, big corkscrews going up. Um, also about probably three, about up to three feet long. Um, very majestic, very, um, yeah, very majestic animal. Amazing to see. 
that is is um, definitely a beautiful animal to see. Um, one of my favorites, um, obviously the elephant. Um, they are just amazing animals to see, and I've had a lot of close and closer encounters with elephants um, throughout the years. So yeah, I do like those buggers as well. Um, cheetahs, um, yeah, I've I've spent a lot of time with cheetahs on on various productions and also while walking in the bush, um, going on anti poaching patrols. Um, it's always interesting to see those those guys that uh, yeah quite endangered and um, actually just big pretty cats. Herman's still thinking about his favorite animal, uh, but in previous episodes we talked so much about the merging between, or there's no real line of division between helping humans and helping animals because living in a world where, you know, they're, they're creatures, they're part of like this earth. I was wondering if you could speak to the importance of animal conservation in your, based on your personal experience, just the way that you grew up and I feel like you and Herman have the commonality of it was instilled in you in a very young age to help people. Like you speak about your mom and being introduced into that environment early on. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the combination to us is quite natural. Is You know, you've got these two environments that everybody tries to to pull apart it's like yes the human side the humanitarian side the the animal side um environmental side if if one of those two isn't healthy the other one isn't healthy either so if the one suffers the other one will suffer somehow that's why it was natural for us to combine the two things i'm wondering how your skills as a wildlife cameraman and an emt have complemented each other like while you're in the field because I feel like it's not just any cameraman you're like a wildlife cameraman <laughs> so I feel like it's a special set of skills that merge together with your EMT skills yeah as a wildlife cameraman you need a lot of time you need a lot of patience um, you go out and yeah spend a lot of time watching these animals, just seeing what, or watching the environment, seeing what's going on, what happens, what are the interactions. Um, a lot of times you can't really, you know, there, there's not not that much about it uh, or not that much research done about it or in, in different ways. Spending that time there um, gets you thinking. There's, there's a lot of thinking going on while you're sitting under a tree and, and hoping for some animals to come past or doing something um, that you need them to do or that you want them to do um being out in the bush um you're not always close to any kind of medical help um so if something happens out there uh, you need to be self-sufficient to a certain extent um we deal with farmers we deal with rangers um that in in, in the bush and these people are sometimes days away from, from any kind of help. Um, in, in the larger national parks, for example, these, these anti-poaching units, they go out and they are like two, three day walk, uh, uh, walks away from, from the nearest station that could help them in any which way. Um, cell phone reception is not everywhere. The coverage is not everywhere. Um, and we are one of the least uh, populated countries in the world. Um, so, yeah, obviously through that cell phone coverage is not necessary everywhere. Or, well, we would like it, but it's not always possible. So, yeah, you need to be able to to look after yourself and maybe after your buddies as well, straight out there. It's something that we really take for granted is the accessibility to medical aid, the accessibility to being able to, you know, use our cell phones or call 911 or get assistance when we need it the most. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk more about the efforts that you're putting towards the Alpha Aid Farm in Namibia, because it speaks to all these components, right? The wildlife aspect of it, as well as having 
a medical resource facility or hub that when you're out in the wild and when you're out in the bush and not being able to have that accessibility? The farm idea came about through on during various of our travels through through Namibia, um, combining combining these things into one hub and making that uh, a blueprint out of that that could be used anywhere in in the world. It's it's not specific to Namibia or to Africa. Um, with a couple of changes, it'll fit um, into pretty much any environment ar around the globe. Help like this needs to be sustainable. Um, and that's where part of the farming comes in. So there is a sustainable part of it, which, which brings, which helps people also help, help others. Um, you know, we can train people up in, in sections of the farm to, to look after themselves, to look after their families, to look after their communities. Medical, again, like we said earlier, the medical help is not everywhere. Um, it's not possible to get medical help everywhere. So have a, yeah, let's call it a trauma center or it's like a first first response center on the farm where people in the area can, you know, can come to and, and you know, get, get looked after and then try and get the, the local EMT service if, if it is available in, in that area at all. Um, get the people into that or bring them to to the next possible hospital from there. Farm life has a lot of a sense and there's there's so much that can happen there. You know, it's, it's a lot of work which would be regarded dangerous in most parts of this world that needs to be done on a daily basis. And um, where, where people work, uh, something can happen. It's unfortunately part of that cycle. Try to combine that all in in a central spot in Namibia. We built different different parts into it more and more. For example, Namibia or the whole of Southern Africa is in in a very severe drought at the moment. Um, Windhoek, the capital of Namibia, has had the worst uh, rain season since eighteen ninety one. I think it was something like that. So that's a few years ago. Um, the rest of Namibia is about an average rain, the lowest rain figures for the last 70 to 90 years. Um, and that's not just Namibia, that's the whole of Southern Africa or big, most big parts of Southern Africa. Other parts are begging, being flooded at the moment. There's less and less fodder available for the animals, for wildlife and also for, for domestic animals. Um, which the communities need. The communities need their goats or their um, cows to look after. You know, they need the milk, they need the meat um, to to feed the families and look after their kids and and so forth. Um, and that's why, yeah, we we started with uh, the fodder production to to get that going and support the people. And I think it's so important too. I feel like again, it's one of those things we take for granted, where it's like, oh, it's there's this devastating drought or these extreme weather patterns and conditions that are happening there. But there's, I mean, really on a serious note, it could wipe out almost, I mean, not to sound dramatic, but it could almost wipe out like a civilization and like the history that's attached to it and the heritage because, you know, like you said, there's livelihood that's attached to it. And then desperate times call for desperate measures and then what happens when there's no longer that cycle's broken um which i think is incredible because the alpha aid we always talk about the alpha aid difference but there is such a emphasis placed on sustainability where you're not just providing band-aid solutions it's how will these people then continue to thrive in another like god forbid if there's another natural disaster or if there's another you know turn in weather there's the ability to navigate that um which i think is incredible that you guys like are able to share your expertise and kind of your problem solving skills to help carry this carry the people through these challenges you guys have such a wealth of knowledge and experiences what made you decide to create your no your own nonprofit and your own cause versus joining forces with something else that exists out there? There are reasons that led to this, right? From my side, um, 
me and my family, we worked for big non-profits and it was just, as you said, not really helpful or sustainable. So we needed to make a difference and we go with our jobs into different countries or you see it in Namibia where big non-profits basically just waste money or donations where it could be just done very easily if you have boots on the ground and you talk to the local people and you get really involved. And that's why we we said we just we just need to do something else because nobody else is doing it and it's not that hard to make a difference. Thought of Alpha 8 came up is because if, if a bunch of guys uh, rock up and, and say like, yeah, we want to help you, um, like, who are you? You know, what, what do you want to do? Um, and that's where the formalization then came in and we started off. Ahead. That's incredible. And I'm wondering if you guys would humor me and share the story of, you know, transporting an ambulance from literally a completely different country down into Namibia where it's needed most. Like take us through that whole process, like when the call came in, like what that timeline looks like because it's pretty incredible what just a couple of guys I mean not to discount it right like I'm like just a couple of guys made this thing happen and it's such an incredible feat um take us through that story so here's the entire story I bought the call and then the rest was all burnt here you go <laughs> <laughs> well, Herman, Herman has this, this weird thing that he's um, decided that I need to go to very cold places regularly. So he dragged me into the Alps at minus 16 degrees and made me sleep in a snow cave one day. Um, I'm from Africa. I like I like it warm. Um, yeah, so and and that's where Herman found that ambulance and and um, yeah, purchased it. And from there, it went not just through from one country to another, it actually went through two countries from one continent to another con continent, um, a couple of thousand miles apart. Yeah, we picked up uh, the vehicle, was prepared. Hermann had it all prepared in, in Germany, in southern Germany. Um, and then I flew across to Germany, picked up the vehicle and took it through to Belgium, into Antwerp, into the port got it ready there for shipping well, it's quite a bit of yeah well not really red tape but it's it's like slightly dark pink tape and we we got it done it was actually quite easy uh we had another one of our colleagues and friends there with us and we had lots of fun drank lots of coffee and um it was ice cold it was snowing and we dropped off the ambulance in the port and then we got stuck in the train system which took us longer to get back than what the drive with the ambulance took us. And then a couple of, yeah, a couple of weeks later, the ambulance ended up in Wolfers Bay in Namibia, in the port, which is actually my hometown where I live now. It was delivered there and we had to um, unwrap layers and layers of red tape to, to get it done. It's a left-hand drive vehicle. We have right-hand drive uh, traffic in Namibia. So that needed a special permission from the minister personally, which he had to sign, which he he saw the need for that. And he saw what we wanted to do with it. And he actually came to office on a Sunday morning and he signed and stamped uh, that permit, that specific permit on a Sunday morning so that on Monday we could get, get um, yeah, keep going with, with going to customs, going to the um, health ministry because of, you know, bringing an ambulance in and, and doing work with that. Uh, talking to the port authorities, then the shipping company, shipping agents. Um, yeah, it was, um, we saw a lot of offices from from the inside and had uh, lots of discussions with lots of different people. Um, and then, as you will also see, there is a video on our YouTube about that. You can go and have a look, about, uh, look at that as well. And then we had a local customs agent by the name of Max, who then one day just decided no, he's going to help us just sort all this stuff out and met with me and dragged me from in one day. We visited four different offices and we had the ambulance. And then we, we still had to find somebody to help us in the port, obviously, because it's a, it's a customs area. Not anybody in any vehicle can go in there. 
So then we had to find somebody that could actually help us with batteries uh, to get the vehicle started because it's been standing for a while. So we couldn't get the the started. We couldn't even unlock the, the vehicle. So fortunately, we had a young security guard there who's a very skinny young man. And he could climb in through one of the, the back windows and actually open the ambulance for us. Um, and then everything went fairly quick. So from day on, and then it's like through the roadworthy tests and um, make sure it's it's street worthy, it's it's safe to to travel on our streets. Um, small little things is European ambulances have blue lights, emergency lights, and in Namibia we've got red emergency lights. Uh, blue is reserved for law enforcement, so we had to get all those lights changed and yeah, it's like lots of lots of different things. And um, yeah, now we've got the ambulance ready for use the usual day in your office yeah exactly yeah <laughs> i feel like this is such a testament of alpha aid like just the people involved and just the mission because i you know i asked herman the same thing i'm like oh my gosh like how long did this take and it was his response was it was six weeks like we there's an there's a need we figure out who we need to talk to who's gonna get involved like get all our team members together figure out the the plan and then execute, which is something that truth be told, a lot of other organizations can't do because, you know, there is so much bureaucracy. There is so much like, well, we have to follow these protocols. We have to talk to this person. And you guys did the same thing. It was like, okay, we need to get the sign off. We need to figure out the transport, but it, it's it's like you guys just figure out what needs to get done and then you get it done. I think that's why we are uh, that different nonprofit organization and not like the the big ones with a huge head of, of management and everything where it takes months and years to make one decision. Your experience because you have involvement with larger nonprofits and you've seen the way they operate. Can you speak a little bit more to the urgency factor of it? Like how much more of an impact you can make when speed is of the essence? We've been working in um, the EMS system. Yeah. So as a um, first responder, right, as a paramedic, and that's where time is at the essence. So you need to be fast because people can die. The big nonprofit environment, yeah. You have some nonprofits which are then uh, mostly governmental in any kind of disaster where they can help fast and rapidly, but that's basically then um, militaries with transportation systems help very fast with a certain escort of uh, paramedics or something. But other than that, there is no there is no nonprofit who acts very fast. Um, not really 100% sure. There's a lot of, I think, politics and uh, um, and steps and uh, rings of fires they have to jump through until they make a decision because they also don't want to just help people. They want to sure they want to be sure that it is uh, received in the best way um, publicly, and that's why I think it goes sideways. Right? If somebody is um, starving or um, whatever, dying uh, because of a disaster or something, then you need to help him. I don't care how somebody else may look at it or something, you need to help. And that's why we are here and uh, we are helping fast. It was also um, that need we had for the big uh, war in Ukraine where everybody, all the big uh, nonprofits donated like tons of equipment and medical and financial aid and everything where we thought, oh, that's, that's not our ball game. That's Hey, the big guys are doing it. Perfect. Awesome. And then we heard from paramedics in Ukraine that they don't have the right equipment to transport people. They actually need uh, paramedic cars, ambulances. And that's where we jumped in. And uh, um, Bernd was part of it. We have some stories we actually uh, swore we never want to tell anybody, right? It was also snow and ambulances, yes. <laughs> Is there a future initiative that Alpha Aid is working on that is both human, like either or it's humanitarian or it's animal activism or it's both that you would like people to be aware of or you want to educate them more about the need to get involved. 
any any NGO can only um, get further if with with involvement of of the broader public. We have a few projects, and uh, one project is, for example, in Namibia, we are getting the EMS um, system up and running, so we have a much better survivability uh, for everybody in Namibia. And we have two other projects. One project which we, we call the feed, feedlot, um, which I mentioned earlier, which is the mainly the uh, it concentrates on the fodder production at the moment. We are in the dry season. We've got the drought um, at part. Um, this that, that is quite a expensive uh, uh, thing to to get off the ground. Um, we need to pump a lot of water. We need to um, irrigate uh, areas. We are going to build new irrigation systems, uh, modernize them to use less water, to use less energy and so forth. So all that kind of stuff needs to be done. We need expertise um, and, and any kind of help um, that, that people can give. You know, not everybody is in a position to help personally or in a position to help financially, but there are different ways in between where people can get involved. Everybody can help if they want to help. 